Hi guys, my name is Athena Island and we are talking about AI products. Today we are in the United Kingdom in London and I invited Tristan who is the founder of Startup Chai. It will be very interesting for you. Hey, Hi Athena, how are you doing? nice to meet you. How are you doing? Good. Do you like to come in? Uh, let's have a walk. Okay, sounds good. Welcome to Banfield Fields. What is famous about this place? So as you can see, there's quite a few famous people buried here. Um, probably the, the three most famous, at least the three that I've heard of, are William Blake, Daniel Defoe, and Thomas Bayes. Blake's an amazing author, poet, painter. Um, I actually bought a bit of his gravestone for one of my friends, because we both share a love of him. And Bayes, Thomas Bayes, we'll go and walk towards his grave, is uh, someone who came up with a principle we use in almost all machine learning, a very important mathematical principle, a long time ago. He was a reverend at the time. Um, so I think it's, it's amazing that these people are all buried in the same place, so near where I work and so near where everyone else works um, in this part of London. Yes, and I like that it connected somehow with our main subject. Would you yeah, say? yeah, exactly. Important. Yeah, it's quite important. So let's, go. so, let's start. And the first question will be about your background. Yep. Yeah, so. so my background um, actually was in a whole bunch of different things. I started off in manufacturing, mm -hmm. actually making things, uh, going to factories and seeing people uh, do what I'd call real work. And then got very interested in machine learning and AI, um, trying to use those techniques in manufacturing and supply chains. It was quite unusual at the time, about 15 years ago. And I pivoted into a different industry. I moved um, into moving money around and hoping it stuck to my fingers. Um, around here as a trader, working first in an old style trading outfit, shouting and being shouted at, because uh, I wasn't very good at it. I found it very boring, but gradually moved more and more into doing stuff with computers, um, writing code that did the trading. And at the same time, trying to use machine learning and AI to even do that part of the process for us. Um, I did that for a while, um, did a PhD in machine learning, another master's before that. And, um, Where did you do the PhD? So I did my PhD at UCL while working actually as a trader at UBS, uh, a Swiss investment bank, mm -hmm. which is quite stressful doing those both at the same time. And then went to work at a hedge fund called Aspect Capital, where I met many of my co-founders where I'm working now. Mm -hmm. um, finished my PhD, left Aspect, and I did a postdoc in medicine. Mm -hmm. So using the same kind of techniques we're using in my company, Chai, we were looking at people's hearts. Mm -hmm. We looked at MRI scans of people's hearts and how they moved over the systolic cycle. And we were trying to find which bits of the heart didn't move very much when it looked like you were gonna die. And we would link that information with how old someone was, whether they smoked, how fat they were, and um, came up with algorithms that could actually predict someone's how long someone had left to live rather morbidly given a diagnosis of a particular disease. These are all these techniques, the kind of things we're doing in a very different way, trying to predict commodity prices at Chai. Um, I finished doing that and a couple of years ago I went on a trade mission with the UK government to try and sell AI to the Chinese. I think it's great John here somewhere. And um, came away feeling very humble. The Chinese are amazing at AI, but managed to pick up a, a client who asked us to predict copper prices. So a large, a large copper factory. Talking about your teammates. Our co-founders, yeah. I mean, the most important thing really when you build a company is who you do it with. Mm -hmm. And I'd seen other people try to do it on their own. Mm -hmm. And the advice that they gave me was always do it with people you really trust, you really like, and you know where, you're, where you differ as personalities and skill sets. They also from different industries. And right? from different industries. Mm -hmm. And um, in this case, you know, three of our team, mm -hmm. including myself, worked at a hedge fund and have known each other, you know, maybe nine or ten years. Mm -hmm. um, we've got Steve, who's the head of markets. Mm -hmm. And he, in this hedge fund, we wish to work with, was the head of trading, and is an old-style pit trader doing all the you know, funny hand movements and stuff, mm -hmm. which is a very different skill set to Mike, our CTO, who built all the code in, this, in our place now, productionized everything we're doing, and in the hedge fund had taken research code and made it uh, much more robust. Mm -hmm. Then there is um, Sylvie, who actually I didn't work with before and was very lucky to meet um, when we were setting this up. He used to work at McKinsey mm -hmm. and more recently in the insurance industry. 
And lastly, Marcus, who I worked in a previous AI startup predicting ambulance callouts. Mm -hmm. um, so he's got experience doing stuff in the world of AI, um, it, but in a very, very different industry to predicting commodity prices. And we don't know each other for a long time. So Marcus, uh, slightly less long, maybe four years, mm -hmm. um, but long enough mm -hmm. to know that I trust him and also that he's incredibly hardworking and gets things done, which is quite important in what we're doing. And we all, yeah, we're all quite different people, but get on with each other very well. And you know, so far it's been um, all that sort of things has gone very well. You have sometimes situations where you argue with each other, or you could... yeah, I'm not sure we've actually got to a state where we argue with each other. And there's bits you need to know that yeah, you... consensus yeah. and things. I think actually, so far we've been lucky that that's not been a problem. There will be occasions where we don't get on and where we disagree. Mm -hmm. And in those situations, actually, um, I don't know. I don't know what we'll do. Um, it depends on how many people disagree on one side versus the other. Hopefully, it won't be like Brexit, where it's completely down the middle and then everything goes horrendously wrong as a consequence. Okay, so you're very friendly. Okay, so let's talk about products. P products, yeah. Yes. What? The problem we're trying to solve is that people in manufacturing. Um, are making things, they're adding value to products, but they're buying those raw materials mm -hmm. at variable prices and typically selling things on at a fixed price. So they're absorbing risk themselves. Mm -hmm. And they don't know how to deal with that problem. Um, you know, if you're a very large organization, you can go and speak to an investment bank and they can help you mitigate that risk, but it costs a lot. Mm -hmm. And small organizations don't even have that opportunity. So, so what we do, is we try and predict commodity prices. And we do that using satellite data, so images taken from the sky above copper mines, uh, aluminum smelters. We look at the movement of boats all around the world. So we know what most boats are carrying, where they're going to, where they came from, how much of what they think carrying, they're carrying. And then other sources of data like currency movements, um, measures of sentiment. And we take all of that data and we combine it using machine learning and AI techniques. Mm -hmm. So going back to the kind of stuff I was looking at for diagnosing heart disease, it's the same kind of maths underneath the hood. You've got all these different kinds of data and you have to glue them together to make predictions about, in that case, how long someone's going to live. In this case, slightly more benignly, what the price of copper might do or oil might do in the future. And we, you know, we go and speak to economists and experts in the commodities we look at. Mm -hmm. And they say, well, you need to look at this mine you need to look at these boats, you need to look at these data sources, and we build models bottom up like that. So it's actually quite fun. It means that you get a really interesting view on economics. Mm -hmm. economics. So um, talking about the value for businesses, yeah. for using people. So for, for businesses, there's a lot of value because quite often an organization goes and buys a risk mitigating product, like a hedge, unnecessarily. They cost loads of money and they've done it when they didn't need to. So we can give them advice you know, not to do that before they do it. But worse, an organization may not try and remove risk from their supply chains and the price moves against them. So if you were you know, a few years ago working with oil through the aircraft industry or well, most industries, mm -hmm. oil went up and up and up and up. And if you hadn't taken protection against that, you'd been in a lot of trouble. But actually we've spoken to some companies who had the opposite problem, where they thought oil was going to carry on going up at the end of last year. Mm -hmm bought protection against it and it went down and they lost loads of money as a consequence. So in both cases we can help quite a lot. And um, for people? Hmm? And for just usual people? For normal people the impact is on the actual products they buy. So we'd hope that the, the things we're involved in predicting the price of, we help an organisation make for a little bit cheaper and that would get passed on to consumers. Mm -hmm. So it's, you know, at some point we're going to start talking to sandwich chains. Mm -hmm. For example, there's a well-known sandwich chain um, in, the, in the UK that apparently spends a lot of money on, on salmon mm -hmm. uh, and if we can help them predict the price of smoked salmon mm -hmm. maybe the sandwiches will be a bit, little bit cheaper for the people when they're buying them on the street because um, if you do something at such scale it has benefits for everyone. That's where William Blake is buried by the way so I own a little bit of that gravestone. Mm -hmm. So they redid that grave maybe a year ago so the old one is there, and this is, I think it's his wife's buried next to him, and this is the new one. So he, actually he's relevant to this discussion, so he was really worried about the Industrial Revolution. Um, and he wrote about it in this famous hymn we have called Jerusalem, and he says, those dark satanic mills, and he's talking about the, 
the industrial revolution up north and he didn't like it, he wanted us all to be, I guess, stay, stay behind. And I think a lot of people look at AI as the next industrial revolution, yeah. which is quite relevant. He yeah, was a very interesting man. I think he was quite crazy though. <laughs> all the best people are. Yeah, that's right. In all sciences. In all sciences, sciences. yeah, in all yeah. sciences. And also in art. Mm -hmm. Someone asked Picasso if he was mad, and he said the only difference between me and a madman is that a madman is mad. Now, talking about market. Yes. Where are you going to sell it? Where, so there is where in geographical sense and which companies. I'll do the which companies first. Okay. So our ideal initial customers are very large manufacturing companies who spend a large amount of money on buying commodities mm -hmm. and have some discretion over the price they may set or how they may hedge out risk mm -hmm. associated with that. In terms of ge geography, we're unusual in that our first client was in China. Well. Our second client is in Thailand. In fact, I was in Thailand last week, just came back on Monday. Mm -hmm. And um, a lot of our interest has been in Asia um, and other countries. Mm -hmm. And it's only recently we've started trying to sell into the UK. And how did you find your first clients? So they found us. So the first one was on a trade mission. Perfect situation. A perfect situation, <laughs> yes. yeah. And the second one, we built our website, and a week later, someone Googled commodities AI. Mm -hmm. They flew out to see us from Thailand and they signed a cheque like a week later. Um, and they've been lovely clients. They're really nice people, they're really great to work with. They understand what we're about. And I just think we've been very lucky. I don't expect that luck to continue, but so far all our interest is people coming to us. So we're gonna start marketing and selling and all those things. Um, but it's amazing how much interest we've had without any effort, which means we've definitely found a problem where, you know, a good problem to solve. Um, that's okay. been fantastic, yeah. Uh, so, talking about you personally. Yeah. Um, as far as I understand, you are 15 years in AI. Right? Yes, yes, pretty much. Yeah. So, what do you think? Where are we going? So I'm uh, an AI skeptic, <laughs> uh, despite being someone who's very in interested in it. And let's talk about machine learning, so the pragmatic side of AI. Mm -hmm. Let's say um, you know where it can be used, predicting things is mm -hmm. one aspect of machine learning. And I think that there's been an awful lot of hype. I think everyone will accept there's been a lot of hype in AI and machine learning. And the danger of that is that you've got lots of people who are incentivized to say they're doing machine learning and AI when they're not. And also they're using machine learning and AI when simple stuff will suffice. Mm -hmm. And complexity for its own sake is always rubbish. In machine learning, and that's even uh, sort of encapsulated in some of the techniques. You should never have complexity unless it's justified. The danger is that with this, you know, people will start getting disillusioned and the entire house of cards will come tumbling down and then in the same way as it's like a positive brand to be associated with machine learning and AI, mm -hmm. we'll get the opposite effect, where it's like, oh, you're doing that, well, that's a bit scary, didn't you hear about that company who was doing stuff machine learning and it folded? Mm -hmm. So I guess I would like to think that we're a company where we're genuinely using machine learning mm -hmm. where no other technique would work. You know, there is no way you can do what we're doing with old style statistics or you know, a great handle on being able to work loads of huge data sources and, and things. So I think in both cases, it's essential we use AI and we are doing it properly. Mm -hmm. so I guess I would say that though. Yeah, <laughs> so. maybe. You know, I think that there are lots of people who are listening to us. Some of them maybe really want to um, organize their own startup yes. and do business in AI. Yeah. But there are lots of different problems. There are so, a lot of different problems. Yeah. Can you wish something to those people who are listening to us and uh, give them advice how to overcome some problems? Have some problems. I think, I mean, it sounds really cheesy, but tenacity is really important. Yeah. Um, a lot of how far you get is sticking with things when people said, no, it's a bad idea. And there's path dependence in that. Mm -hmm. You know, if, if nine people say no to you and one says yes in that order, it's quite hard. But if you've got that yes at the beginning and then nine say no, it's a lot easier. And I've been lucky with this one that has been quite a nice sort of sequence of yeses and noes to go through. But it's sticking with something. Mm -hmm. But having the humility to readdress people's concerns when they say it's not a great idea, that's not machine learning or AI dependent, that's any startup, is that knowing where the trade off between humility and maybe you got it wrong and tenacity and other people might have it wrong lies. That's a really important thing. Also, I think that. Um, I think my view is there's a lot of people setting up companies from straight out of university mm -hmm. who haven't worked in the real world. Again, I'm biased because I've worked quite a long time before going into this. I don't believe you can do something like build a company unless you've got 
that experience of, of what it's like to work in, in another industry and the kind of connections and the uh, grit a little bit to cope with some of the setbacks you have, personally. That's my view. And the, and the last thing is just find good people to do it with because it's really hard to do this stuff on your own. So you were lucky with... Lucky with, yeah, the people, things. yeah. Obviously very lucky with the co-founding team and finding people who have a different skill set mm -hmm. and different personality types because you need people who are all the different kinds of personality types. That's really important, I think. So yeah. just be lucky, guys. Be lucky, yeah. <laughs> exactly, if you can, <laughs> try to be lucky. Yeah.